this week I have plenty of proposed plans to go through at different sites. We have a dispute over two and three star vision going into London. We have a stubborn pin that's gonna require a lot more than elbow grease to get it out. And at a refurbishment project, we're not working on smoke. We're working on heat. I'm Daniel on this Asheville Weekly, episode 143. It's Monday, I'm not in the yard. I'm at the refurbishment project. And where there once was a staircase, there is not a staircase. Staircase and the concrete landing has been completely removed as we prepare for the delivery of the staircase, which I spoke about in last week's episode. Click here to watch that video. The staircase is in fabrication stage, but we're trying to work out what we're gonna do with the actual steps. We're gonna have a build up on the step of ply and cement board, but will we have a slight steel down stand on the end of it? So our tile has somewhere to fix on the front to cover the LED channel, which is gonna be on the underside. The concrete slab used to sit here in line with the window level. So it's been removed. We're building up the area with engineering bricks. This is as far as we can go. And then we're mixing up some dry pack over here and that's gonna fill in the gap around. We're using these Acros and Strong Boys to hold up the wall because the slab was fitted in. And then what we're gonna do is remove the remaining bits of the slab, support the wall, and then we're gonna do more engineering bricks and dry pack. Now there's gonna be a steel going here afterwards, but we don't know the height yet. But what we do know is of course the new landing of the steel staircase will be in line with the bottom of the window because we're not gonna have a landing in the middle of the window because that's gonna look pretty rubbish. Utility layout completely agreed with the client. On this side of the wall, we have lovely cabinets, which all have glass fronts with lights in them. And on this side, we have the extra large sink, worktop space. We have integrated two washers and two dryers. This area is used more as a huge laundry and storage area because within the cupboards at either end, you can store all your hoovers, but we're putting power points in them so you can charge all your bits and pieces. You know, they say the devil is in the detail. Well, we thought these were the final sizes. We've made all our build-ups. However, in last week's episode, I told you about the track system which can sit in the ceiling and theoretically can sit between the joists. Now, here's the problem with that. We need to know how much we can build up these areas on both sides. This has to follow through and it makes the area up here that bit smaller. Now, you might not think that's a problem, but if we build up in this area and this area is now down here, that means that the line of the start of the bifolds can no longer be here. And of course, we want the bifolds to line up with the windows up here so you have symmetry. We're gonna take a view and we're gonna build up both sides by 100 mil because that's enough to fit any lighting features, any blind tracks, and then we're gonna reduce the size of this opening so the bifold you see here lines up with the start of the fixed pane here. We're saying we have gotta take it all out. Yeah. Why, it's not strong, none of it. It was strong, but when you remove the slab, yeah. Every time we touch something in this house, it falls apart and we end up having to rebuild it, man. Oh, now all of this has got to come out and we have to rebuild the entire area. The loft is a decent size. The majority of the temporary scaffold roof has been removed. As you can see, we have loads of natural light. We have made the final build up around the window. However, we haven't made the final build up on the sides here, which is going to build out by another around 80 mil. And then this plasterboard here will finish into the frame that you can see over there. We're working on a lovely little bit of storage. It's not in the plans, client doesn't know about it. As long as the client isn't watching now, it's gonna be a great surprise for them. This area in here, because they don't love storage. Everybody loves storage. No matter how much storage you've got, you're just gonna fill it out with more stuff. We're thinking of where we're gonna put the door. We may well put the door here or there but there's this massive recess. So we're gonna board the area out completely. To give you an idea of perspective, through these joists over here is the master bedroom. So you can imagine the challenge we've got with trying to make this area completely soundproof, just so people can also lean on it 
I won't say walk on it, but lean on it and store items. We're going to put 12 mil ply or 18 mil ply here. Then we're going to build it up with two 15 mil soundboard. On the other side of these joists, we're going to have 15 mil soundboard as well. And in between the joists, uh, we're going to have acoustic insulation. But here's a, it's a great area, like it's massive. You can store loads of bits and pieces here and we're gonna go all the way around there. This is not living space, in case you're asking why we don't just make it part of the loft. Building control is probably not gonna have it because the area of loft we were allowed to convert as part of the loft conversion. A structure engineer had a look and structurally it's fine as a storage area, but it's not built for a living space. Now I'm heading to the 15 million pound house to see how we're getting on. It's got nothing to do with what's going on out here. That goes to the back of the line, yeah? We have teams working simultaneously. We have one team bringing the two to six mil, no fines, from the front to the back because the 5G football pitch work is going to start on Wednesday and this is the top level of material that needs to be leveled out. The fire pit work is going very well. You can see some holes at the ends. That is for the circulation of the fire pit, also so the rainwater can be managed. We have a drain at the front and drain at the back and when the tiles are laid on the floor and around the fire pit, it will transfer the rainwater water so it's managed correctly. The steps are also built which are looking really good. There's like a helicopter going past. We counted like something like 40 helicopters a day. That's how you know it's an affluent area. So the type one you can see over there, we're going to use to fill up this area. We've already put shingle around the water pipe and then the tiling that you can see going on on both sides will then finish over here to the edge. So this existing decking, we need to cut this off we're going to use the existing planks and finish it and then use a piece and put it on the front side so it looks like it did originally but with the lovely new tiles in place. Back in the yard we're doing a repair work on the volumetric. There are a couple of cracks in the body so we're gouging out the cracks and then we're welding it to make it strong. We had to put a plate in this area because there was a significant crack there. These chassis and bodies go for a lot of stretch so the cracks do appear, but when they do, we keep on top of it. End of the day, I had some clattering and banging going on, and it sounded like something going into the body of a lorry, and it was the yard next door. And I thought to myself, hold on a minute, what are these lads using someone else? And then I looked out from my office over to the other side, and I was happy to see an Asheville grab taking away some concrete. I spent some time with David going over the pool house plans for the refurbishment project and we have a presentation to make to the client and we're given two options doing it fully which basically means taking it down and building it again because there's so many changes a different size pool at a different angle with bifolds fully opening with a new roof on it and it's actually expanded as well so it's going to be like about 2,000 square foot in total and then we've done another one where we save the existing structure, leave it as it is and change all the pumps for the pool and we add an air handling system. The cost to refurbish it is roughly 50% of the cost to do it properly. Now I'm presenting those options to the client as that is my obligation to do so and it's the client's decision, whichever one they go for. But I just think to myself sometimes, should I even present the half as good refurbishment option because I know the client and I know the client won't be happy because they're not going to get what they want. It's a question of spending a certain amount of money and getting something as opposed to spending half as much amount of money and not getting what you want and it bothers you every time you use it. It's trying to weigh up the balance there but that is not my decision to make and people make decisions for different reasons and we often offer these options to clients and sometimes they go for the option which they are not happy with in the end and they continually try to do add-on and add-on and add-on and add-on and try and get it to a point where they're happy with it. But generally by the time they got to that, they're at the same price if you had just done it right the first time. We're waiting for one more lorry to get back to the yard. Ben is still out. A couple of weeks ago, you saw the two bins that we bought. Well, there was a third bin. I spoke to my townie and he knows the state of the bin, but the structure of it's good and it's gonna need a bit of work but we kind of took it as a deal and now we won't need to buy any 40 yard bins for a while. So in the last two weeks, we've got an additional three of them. But I can't see Ben yet. I was hoping to catch him as he came back. There he is. See? And just as I've left the yard, Ben returns with our, not new, 
Well, it is new, but it's not new. 40 yard bin. It's Tuesday morning, I'm in the yard, just washing down the loading shovel because we're gonna take the ram off and we're gonna send it up to be repaired. While I'm down here, I'm having a look because this eight ton machine here is going out in the morning. Kind of got ourselves set up, checked my paperwork, and that is gonna go on here. Going out with four buckets, make sure it's full of diesel, track it onto the flatbed, strap it all down, make sure it's safe, put it onto the back of the roll-on, roll-off crane combo lorry, and be ready to go out first thing in the morning. Going on a little mission around the yard, looking for that Ben. Looking for that Ben, you know? Looking for that bin <laughs> that Ben brought in last night. Okay, we definitely need a new headboard and a straight piece along the top. It's come away there. Hopefully we can fix that. The machine can push the sides in. Oh no, we're gonna need to do it here also. The hinges look to be okay, but I'm not gonna be able to tell a lot until I try and open it. I am not a salvage hunter or a hoarder. Not the best bin in the world. We provided a service in exchange for it. So unfortunately, as my townie says, you must really hate me. These things you got me working on. And the loading shovel is off into the repair bay. Get the ram taken off. Concrete lorry is about to go out. My townie has told me to have a look at how the volley goes over the railway tracks. I think we need to put some concrete in the gap here because the, the suspension is uh, getting a battering. definitely going to have to pour something which leaves a large enough gap away from the rails because otherwise it's going to interfere with the wheels on the bogies which basically means the wagon wheels on the train now i'm going to my office oh no wait hold on we got some end delivery last week i spoke with my cfo about our ebitda we're just talking about new lorries. I made an estimation of what I believe lorries will generate on a monthly basis revenue wise. Then we had to go back into finance costs to the monthly maintenance, driver wages, fuel and insurance. And we had to up those costs. When you include the cost of the lorry and then all of the expenses attached to it, there's not really a lot left at the end of it. It changes the business as a whole because there's more jobs you can do. You don't let anyone down, therefore you gain more business and you're paying off the lorry, which at the end you own and it has a value and it also sits on your balance sheet. So it's the value of the lorry minus what it's worth. But plugging in the lorries, you can see once you start to go off the volume, you can see at this sort of level, the numbers you know increase significantly but an increased number in revenue once you count the cost it doesn't necessarily mean a significant increase in profit it's my second meeting today it's now 11 15 i've got one at 12 and one at two. Oh, there's a loading shovel the lads are from limerick and when i first saw this i thought the lads were from limerick but they're from limerick junction now that is a race course and railway station in Tipperary. So shout out Tipperary and shout out Limerick. V8, 5A. Low loader on it. We like that. Wednesday morning and Komatsu have dropped off a loading shovel for us to demo. Very handy to get it now as Baz is repairing our bucket and we are down a shovel. So slightly smaller than our 586, but Komatsu tell me it's more than capable. Oh look, that's a nice fresh bucket with a nice cutting edge. So Komatsu said they're going to come in tomorrow and show us how to use it. I mean, we know how to use it, but obviously it's got special features and we haven't had a Komatsu shovel in here before. So we'll park it up and wait till tomorrow. And speaking of plant, we are now doing the delivery to site of that eight ton machine.
We're actually struggling with a loading shovel to get the pin out on the ram so we can actually take the ram off to get it repaired. So we've got some help in today because the pin is sea solid. Everything's been getting grease, but it looks like this has been washed. Not the boy's fault, they've been using acid to wash it off. And when they've used it, everything is completely corroded. We have beat this every way we can yesterday, trying to get it out and not working. So now it's time to try a different approach. The process here is to create a bracket which we can attach to the arm to give us something to push against. We need to scurf the paint off at first and then weld it so it's nice and strong. Here we're using a rose torch and we're heating the area around to roughly a thousand degrees. We do this because when metal gets hot, it expands. This is an air over hydraulic foot valve connected to a hydraulic ram. Now we are gonna use this to push against the bracket and try to push the pin out. Even with the bracket and the hydraulic ram, it's still not enough. We still need to hit the pin as hard as we can to give it a shock. Back on the heat, trying to get the area as hot as possible. And slowly, slowly, we push out the pin bit by bit. We're just putting a ratchet strap around the ram to ensure that when the pin does come out, the ram stays in place. Here it goes. Bang! There it is. Look how rusty that is. Having a look in here, you can see that it was taking grease. We had to use the combined efforts of heat, a hydraulic ram, brute force, and a bracket. Pyro and plot repairs to the rescue. Always good to work with a local business. And I'm gonna admit that Michael O'Donovan did introduce me to him and he's gonna be going on about it. Michael O'Donovan reckons that he got me out of stuck again which he did on this occasion. We've asked Baza, who's fixing the bucket, to get us a price on some of these bushes. There's only three bushes and the price that I got quoted for three bushes. So we've taken the measurements of the existing ones. And if you look at a little drawing here, Baza laid out the dimensions that he wanted from these to try and get some made. If you look at the little dots at the side, those dots are the grease points. And this is the outside of it, kind of like the track. So it's important to get those right. And when you get those right, so these are the two on the lift ram, those, and that is the dog bone one. Ow. Now we'll get a price for those as well, and hopefully we can save a bit of money. Should be a good few weeks, but we should have this uh, back out working. And in the meantime, we'll use the Komatsu demo and let them know what we think of it. Cement delivery. I'm now heading to the 15 million pound house for a site meeting spread in the last of the two to six mil. The 5G is gonna arrive at any second and the shock pad was gonna go underneath it. So check this, we have our frame here. All of this material needs to be compacted to go slightly lower. The shock pad, which is kind of like a membrane, will then roll out and the shock pad will be flush here. Then the 5G will be pulled over the top of this and will be fitted into this. That's what's gonna hold the football pitch in place. The people who are gonna mark the pitch out, like the lines of just the box of where I'm gonna stand outside and smash the ball into the top corner like I've done in the past. <laughs> They're gonna be here on Sunday. So quite a bit of work to do, but it's definitely doable. And the guys are just preparing to ensure that when the materials get here, they can crack on straight away. Bespoke concrete structure poured almost 10 days ago in this area. This is part of the water slide that's gonna go into the pool. We've extended the wall. Now we need to bring all this paving around here. Now, in order to do all this paving, I need to break this out the mold. The longer I leave it, the stronger it's gonna be. And I'm not worried, I just have reservations. So I think I may wait till Saturday because as soon as I break that out, I can then continue the tiling around here and then this will also look finished. Back in the yard and we're just using the machine to lift the piston out of the barrel. They're gonna decide if they can repolish it and it will be okay. But the leak is here in the collar, the seal right in here. But having a look at the barrel, the barrel looks completely fine. So it's actually a lot easier for us to just take this out and send this and then they'll let us know what they think. How are we on tyres, Joe? We, we all right? Ooh. 
Yeah. Just right over them again. Again? And what's well, wrong so with basically, them? Basically, the other day, Yeah. I had I'll give Terry a full list of lorries that I need tracking to it. Tracking? Tracking. Volvo, Scania's, and they all needed tyres. I give him a full list, but then I put all these, these are what they were looking like. Ah. Uh, Okay. Well, obviously, he's got all of the tracking man to come in now, but I've had to change a yeah, lot but why, of Yeah, but why are we paying for the tracking if we've got full R&M with Scania? Shouldn't Scania be doing the tracking, no? I, I don't know how that works, but yeah, I was hope so. What is that? What happened there? That was one of the concrete lorries. No, how's that happened? I think Ollie said something about the same thing he was driving over in a, in a job or something. It was on Ollie's lorry. Oh my goodness. So I'll change that one, but that's a... Yeah, so that's what I've got left of what we ordered the other day. I oh, know, but if you go around all the lorries, we're all Yeah, we said that the other day, look at these. <laughs> <laughs> these are the these were the rims I stripped yesterday ready to put the rest of the tyres on. Yeah. But one good thing is all those tyres at the back there are good. That's the part worn tyre. Instead of putting new on everything, I can mismatch. You sort of so you got the same mill on each of them. Okay, fine. So now all these here, these are all punches that I fixed that are good tyres. And what's going on here? These are good, yeah? Everything's good. Them punches there are, are near enough done. All yeah. That whole line there has all good tyres coming back on. It's all wet and smudgy. We ain't getting as many nails because ah. when it dries out in this weather, yeah. everything's coming to the surface. So we're getting more punches. That's why we've ended up more punches. Ah, okay. It's called, they call it puncher season, don't they? Yeah, what? Well, because everything comes to the surface. So we okay. don't need any more tyres yeah. at the minute. We won't need any. Until tomorrow? No, no. We won't. <laughs> it's good that we're keeping on top of it. It is costing us, but it's 100% better safety-wise and financially if we spot it before it happens. And it just means that the tire fitter works different hours. So at the end of the day, when all the lorries come back, we can check all the punctures, we can check wheel nuts, we can check the tread to make sure that first thing in the morning, all the lorries go out on the road safe, even if it is costing a fortune. It's actually cost less to be safer and keep on top of it. <laughs> oh. What's happened there? Look at that. Oh. What's that? What? What's that doing? What's he called? Rupert. Isn't that a bear's name? No, it's a dog's name now. Fair enough. <laughs> Rupert the dog. <laughs> Thursday. I'm in the yard. Once again, we're on this loading shop. We're trying to overcome a little problem. We need to cap off one of the pipes because when we turn it on and try to move it, the hydraulic oil starts pumping out of it, but it's not a standard fitting. So we've had to bring a specialist around who popped around yesterday, didn't have the fitting, but they've gone back to the workshop and come back this morning. On the side of it to loading shovels, the Komatsu team are in and they are showing the lads how to use the shovel. And there's something interesting about this shovel that none of our shovels have at the moment. No steering wheel. How do we steer? Right. Lever. EJSS, yeah. Okay. The loading shovel's got no steering wheel. It's not something we've had in the yard before. I know there are plenty of them everywhere and people are using it, but it's new to our lads. When you put your foot down and you're revving, it doesn't affect the hydraulics and the hydraulics have got different switches to turn the revs up and down if you need more power. The gear that we dropped off yesterday to be repaired, we have one or two choices. We can have it re-chromed, but that could take three to six weeks, or we can just put a new stick on it. Now the prices are relatively the same. I want it back as soon as possible. So that repair is gonna begin now. Hopefully we'll have that back in about two weeks. Ben just coming back to the yard. He's got another exchange to go out and do. He's got to go and tip it. And then the eight ton machine, which went out the other day, he needs to collect that and bring that back to the yard. Securely capped off, we're gonna park it in the yard somewhere out of the way where no one's gonna use it. And the demo shovel is loading in the other yard. Taking a little bit of getting used to, but I'll get there. Better safe than sorry. On the road again. The time is 3.57. I'm heading up to the north of the country because I have been invited by Scania to a dinner this evening and then tomorrow morning to go to the road truck expo to have a look and see what's going on my understanding is at the dinner there will be hauliers from up and down the country so gonna have a spot of grub with everyone and chew the fat our mate sever rail ben has been in contact 
and they have a lorry full of the rubber which we use to fit between the rail lines so we can cross over it and that is arriving in the yard right now. Just going back and forth with Bartek and David about the stairs again at the refurbishment project and how we're going to fix to it. See, I want to limit this build-up of this 18mm ply and then this 6mm cement board. If we cannot work out the exact build-up, then they can't manufacture the staircase. It will be easier to fit 18mm ply to the steel and then we fit the cement board to the ply. However, then we have a very thick build-up. If we don't use ply and we fix the cement board directly to the steel, you need to do so many fixings every 200 mil and going through a six mil board into a 10 mil steel, this could be really difficult and we may need to pre-drill all of the holes, which is gonna be a nightmare. But a douche had a great suggestion. We are gonna ask the fabricator for a sheet of the 10 mil mild steel. We're gonna take it to site now and we're gonna see how it works and what we can fit to it. In other news, again, at the refurbishment project, we were looking at different fire systems. Because of the open plan area we have with the kitchen, dining, living, the front door, which is so close to the stairs, building control said this is a fire issue. Basically, if there is a fire in the kitchen, there's not enough to stop it. And people who are coming from upstairs, they won't be able to get out the front door. We went through many options, and now we have gone for a smoke vent system, which will take the smoke out of the property, but we have had to go for a sprinkler system. And they sort of like, look like spotlights. We had to put four in the dining room and six in the kitchen, but, this sprinkler system does not operate on smoke. It operates on heat. So only when it gets above a certain temperature will these turn on. I'm just happy that it's not working on smoke because if somebody's smoking or something burns in the toaster or on the oven or anything can happen, next thing you know, the whole house is drenched and I need to come in and refurb it again. Let's put the kitchen there then. And you see the cupboard that you've put that you can see as soon as you come in. Let's have that, the same design as the kitchens. And then the wall yeah. with the games room, we can put additional units against that wall. Yes. As long as the edge where you look at it from the entrance, so there's a feature on the end of it. It's a triangular shape. In the middle of the room there, let's have that feature like quite wide, like that. And then the TV yeah. fixes onto it and then they oh, face nice. there. So basically, when you're sitting at the dining table, the fireplace is on your left-hand side, like there, yeah, that's cool. Do you see the way those shapes are all, th those shapes fit in in the central part of the room? That way you have yeah. lots of space to walk around on both sides. I would say on one side, there would be an outdoor, like entertaining area, like at the refurbishment project. And on the other side will be like an urban garden. So one side will be entertaining with the outdoor build up for the fridges and the worktop space and the seating area to dine and everything. If you could work on that and then we'll look at it again before you send it to him, yeah? Yep, cool. All right, thank you, Sam. It's Friday and I'm in the car, sat in a field in the middle of nowhere. I've come to the truck show with Scania, but I had to go through a project with Sam, our architect, and decide on the layouts of the huge extension, living area, kitchen, and the outdoor landscaping space. It needed to be done now so Sam can work on it. By the time I finish and get back to the yard later, he'll have a plan that I can look at. Then we can make a couple of changes and hopefully send it to the client for them to view it over the weekend. Ah, oh, they didn't use any of the ones that I'm on. My good friends at Tarfinger. Not bad, mate. How you doing? You all right? How we doing? You all right? Hmm. Bottle mixers. It's going to come in handy soon. 
How are we doing? Well, can I ask a bit of advice? You know yeah. your video that you did with G G GB Rail Freight? Like, yes. My brother was so inspired by the video. He wants a career in um, railway. What does he want to do? Drive trains or? No, he wants to be in the uh, railway, so like uh, operations manager. For he may be better off to reach out to Network Rail and GB Rail Freight. If you go on their website, they've also got a careers page there. You always watch your videos. Thank you, yeah. mate. I appreciate yeah, that. How's the work going? Yeah, I can't complain, you know. Do you think the rail yeah. industry might be difficult here? In the future? No, I, I think that the rail industry will continue to grow because they want to take vehicles off the road yeah. and we're, we're never going to use less of what we're using now. Yeah. Demand is only going to increase and they don't want to put it on the road. No. It's got to go something, they're not going to yeah. fly it there. Yeah, so, so rail will continue to grow yeah. and all the rail we have got, we still need to look after it. Great to meet really you, mate. Yeah. Enjoy your time here. Right? You too, mate. Yeah. Somebody um, watched the episode with John Smith and they felt inspired to get involved in more rail. Good luck to the lads. Sorry, mate. I just want to commend you on how well dressed you are. Oh, you'd love it, wouldn't you? Hi there, sorry. 560. These are nice, aren't they? It's my mate Cash from Crown Aggregates. Look at that. Here we go. Extended range biogas CNG, an R410. We're going to have to go green eventually. Oh, I've never even seen this before. I'm sure that, that don't mean that this costs 25 pence. I'm sure this is somewhere in the region of 350,000 pounds. 100% battery. Never seen a charging station like that. The electric lorries are coming up more and more. It's something that we all need to do. However, we need to find a way to make it pay. Maybe some support from the government or from major projects that we're working on. 8%. Mm. That is a big old lump, isn't it? Look at that. Heading back to the yard, managed to have a look around at everything. I feel like I'm pretty up to date on what's happening with trucks, except for the um, Scania gas. And it made me have a think. Previously, what I used to do is decide on a, on a period of growth. And then I would order, I don't know, 10, 12, whatever, 15 lorries. And then I would speak to the manufacturer and I would stagger it. And I would say, give me one every two months, just so cash flow wise, we can pay the deposit. And I stopped doing that because I started speaking to a lot of projects and I was letting the projects kind of govern what I was doing or what sort of chassis they would be and how many we would need as opposed to doing it the other way around, which completely backfired because two of the projects got mothballed and one of them can't make up their mind and the other one, we didn't get it, they went with someone else. So it just kind of messed up everything we're doing. Hence the knee jerk reactions and going to buy trucks from other sources which aren't 100% your specification. So I think now I'm gonna go back to the drawing board and I'd say it'll probably be tippers and a tractor unit and say, right, this is the magic number of uh, tippers that we'd like to get up to. We need this many, we need a tractor unit. These are the months that we want them to be delivered and we will not take them before, even if you have them, and manage it and plan it in and then act accordingly and then we can be proactive in our cash flow and be proactive in our hiring of new staff to push on turnover, to push on sales and to push on infrastructure. That's how I used to do it before and it would work perfectly well, but for some reason I decided to change my plan and got myself all in a model. So, decided I'm gonna go back to basics. Time is 7 p.m. Just going for a walk to have a look at one of the trucks. I worked on a deal for a little while and it's come off. The work should be starting in about two weeks, importing material from a new supplier. It was a lot easier than it's been in the past because we had to raise our credit limit because of the quantities that we're gonna be bringing in. But because we now have a CFO and we always have everything on spreadsheets and we can extract it from the system because the work's been put in, the information they asked for, we were able to send it over in seconds and they came back within a couple of hours and increased the credit limit by about 10 times, which is very handy. And we got three trains coming next week, which is good because we haven't had any for a couple of weeks. We got two trains of type one, Tuesday and Thursday, and a train of 70% sand and 30% gravel coming in on Friday. Now I'm gonna have a look at this lorry now because uh, Simon has been working with TFL, just making sure that the uh, ratings on the lorries are correct on the system because as of next October, Lorries which aren't free star vision can't go into London. Transport for London are trying to say that our lorries are two star. 
when I bought these lorries, I specifically remember inspecting everything so they would be free star. So firstly, they've got the emergency braking. We've got the front mirror, so you can see what's going on here. We've got the curbside mirror. We've got the London door, a side scan. We've got the warning vehicle turning left. We've got cyclist rails, the rear underrun bar, white noise when reversing. Recordable five camera CCTV. I know it's a construction chassis, but for me, that qualifies the lorry to be three star vision. I'm being told the lorries aren't allowed in London next year. I mean, like, uh, so I need to go back to Scania, have a word with them, and then try and speak to someone at Transport for London myself and try and work this out. And hopefully they're wrong and I'm not wrong. Otherwise I've got to go spending a bunch of money trying to put even more things on lorries when I thought that I had already done all that work. That's it for Friday. Saturday morning, I'm at the 15 million pound house. Shock pad in place on the 5G pitch, and you can see some of the grass is in. We're just waiting for the lads to arrive so they can continue with this. This should be finished today. So tomorrow, on Sunday, we can do all the markings. At the same time, we're breaking away the mold on a concrete structure, but we can't just go in there and just smash it to pieces because we could damage what we've built which has had 14 days to dry. So technically the concrete should be at about 90, 95%, you could argue 100% of its characteristic strength. But I'm just here watching because I'm interested in this and I wanna see what this looks like. The conversation I had yesterday over Zoom with Sam he put together a layout after our discussions and he had a brainwave. Have a look at this little pantry that he added for the kitchen. And then the layout in the master ensuite. So when people are in bed, they can look out to the bay window. We'll have some French doors and a decent sized ensuite and a wardrobe. That went to the client this morning at 7 a.m and the client messaged me and said they wanted to go over it. If I can mark up the plans a bit, then any changes, Sam can do them over the weekend, and then we can go back to the client on Monday, Tuesday with a revised layout and begin to develop it further. But once we do get all the plans right, we then need to quantify and work out the cut and fill work in the back area and building the extension and the finishes. And then it's gonna take a good couple of weeks to price that accurately. The client sent me a couple of links to like a sandstone material, what they like. The house is gonna have like traditional character, but the pictures they sent me look like the houses that you would see in Bath with the limestone. Now I explained to the client, the real limestone, it looks really good, it's really nice, but it's expensive to buy, it's expensive to fit, and it requires maintenance. It requires a lot of upkeep. So I've suggested possibly we find something where you have the same uh, visual effect, but it doesn't require the maintenance gonna be, and it can be fitted slightly easier. The client can say no, and then we can just go for the limestone if they want it to be authentic, but I've offered the alternative also. Really good client meeting. We went through the plans together and I was able to show plenty of examples of completed projects of work that we've done in the past and give the client loads of ideas. And we managed to work on the plan in order to progress it. It's good when a client is interested in the, in the project and they get back to you because then you can speedily make the amendments and send it to them and then the project's continually got like momentum. When there's like a gap and you don't hear from someone for two weeks and then they come back and then it like, it just, it slows it down. But in this way, now I'll, I'll draft some notes. I'll send this back to Sam, he'll change it. We could send it back to the client and then we could move the project forward. Liking it, a productive Saturday. It's Sunday and I'm at home, but I'm still working. Train this morning, 
been sat in front of the computer for a couple of hours trying to prepare for the week ahead. Last night was a sticker man's birthday, so we went out and had something to eat. And the sticker man has kindly agreed to get me on a list for the car I've decided that I want. Now, I'm not going to tell you what that car is, but it's not out yet. But these things are funny with cars. You can't just think that you're going to get a car. You've got to get onto the list if they let you. Like, it turns out, like, your money's not good anywhere. Like, you have to be invited to be on the list. So the sticker man's trying to get me on the list. If I get on the list, I'll let you know what that car is. Ashwell Wheatley came out earlier, and it reminded me that I was talking to somebody about the secondhand cube testing equipment. So I've added that to my list to change tomorrow. Earlier this week, you saw me looking at the lorries and talking about the three-star vision, what they all need to be to go into London next year. In having a look at that, I've actually looked at some of the Aura lorries that we purchased, like the Volvo Volumetrics. They don't actually have London doors on them. Now, we do it as good practice when ordering brand new, but to be honest, it's kind of slipped my mind with those used Volvo tippers and Volvo Volumetrics. They don't have a London door. Searching through to see the people who actually fitted it. At the time we ordered the lorry, Scania didn't make the London doors in the factory. They had someone come in and do it. So I actually like to put the London doors on the lorries which don't have it. And of course, that adds to our star rating which i need to get up to free on order lorries and they should be because they're all newish euro six lorries and while they're fitting the london door to the lorries um speaking to the company who fitted all the cameras and side scans on the lorries again when they were in scania i'm gonna get them in and have a once over and go over everything on the lorry now it, it's one of those things that we hadn't had to give any attention because it's kind of it's just been working but with these new free star vision regulations it's a good time to be reminded and a good time to go over those lorries from front to back and ensure everything's working 100 percent which it is anything that isn't we'll fix it anything like the london doors that's missing we'll get those fitted also going to continue to schedule emails to go out to people tomorrow morning the time now is 4 46 i should be finished about an hour hour and a half and it gives me the rest of the evening to try and watch a film and chill out a bit and that's it for Asheville weekly episode 144 click here for the Asheville website click here to subscribe to our channel Click here to see an actual video you may not have seen before and click here for last week's episode which was none which was number 143. <laughs>